I think I'm going to start in. Good morning and welcome everybody to the Center of Addiction and Faith and our monthly webinar. Our special guest today is Dr. Kate Godet. Did I have that right, Kate? Is it Godet? Okay. I should have checked with you before we started. Dr. Godet is Associate Director of the Honors Program and Faculty in Humanities at the University of New Hampshire. Today, she's going to be helping us understand the various beliefs about addiction and how addiction narratives originate. I'm so grateful she's here. I'm also grateful all of you are here, more than 300, I think 320 of you signed up from across the country for this webinar. We'd love to know where you're from today. Um, if you wanna click on the chat button below and share your name, city and state where you're from, we'd love to see that. It's always fun to watch. Um, I'm opening my chat page so I can watch you populate. If you have questions during the webinar today, um, you can start put placing those in the Q&A uh, button below and we'll get to as many of those as we can after Dr. Kate completes her presentation. But know that following the webinar here today, there will be a 30 minute Zoom discussion for all of you who wanna stay and talk and meet Dr. Gaudet and ask questions. The link for that Zoom meeting will be in the chat page. Please make a note of it if you plan to attend. Once we close the webinar uh, that link goes away and there's no way to get it to you. My name is Pastor Ed Treat. I'm an addict. I've been in recovery from addiction for 35 years. I am the founder and CEO of the Center of Addiction and Faith. After 25 years as a parish pastor, I recently resigned my call as senior pastor of a church in Bloomington, Minnesota, in order to follow God's call to educate and inspire faith communities to better understand and respond to addiction. Now as emerged from the COVID pandemic, we are finding addiction, mental health, uh, domestic violence, suicide issues, all going through the roof. We all have another enormous health crisis to face. I believe faith communities can and should play a vital role in helping people recover, but I think they also have a lot of learning to do. The mission of the Center of Addiction of Faith is to help faith communities ramp up to respond to this huge problem. Along with these webinars, the Center of Addiction and Faith offers many helpful resources. We have our annual conference that brings together today's best and brightest scholars, theologians, speakers, authors, practitioners in the field of addiction studies. Twice a month, we share a new podcast telling the story about how clergy were impacted by addiction and then found recovery. Great stories. We have a number of online 12-step recovery and support groups, one specifically just for clergy. What's so great about these 12-step uh, meetings is they are attended by folks who are church people and people in recovery. They, they know the language of both worlds. We have training events to develop addiction ministry programs. We support advocacy work. We're developing online education for understanding addiction in the context of doing ministry. We offer daily devotions and there's a lot more we wanna do and offer. We're just getting started. I hope you'll register for the conference next October. That's about the best thing we do. Uh, it's, it's a mountaintop experience. We've done two so far and they get, uh, they're just tremendous. Uh, would love you to check out our website, addictionandfaith.com and download our free smartphone app. That app has many valuable resources right at your fingertips. Go to your app store, look for Center of Addiction and Faith. And did I mention it's free? Before I turn you over to my co-host to introduce the topic and our speaker, let us begin with prayer. We, we need all the help we can get. And, and as we pray today and throughout the days ahead, I would ask you to think about the people of India who today are suffering tremendously at the hand of the pandemic. Uh, just horror stories. Uh, my heart goes out to them. Hold them in your heart as well. The Lord be with you. Gracious and loving creator, we thank you for the gift of life and health and vitality. And while we are grateful, we know that not all things are as healthy and vital as they should be. Our world is broken in many places and it needs healing. Sometimes that brokenness seems so great that it seems hopeless. What can we do? We lift our eyes to you, maker of heaven and earth. We need your help, we need your guidance. And we know with your help, all things are possible, that there's always hope. Inspire us to know, inspire us now with hope and determination to bring healing to your world. Guide us with hope and determination, knowing you are with us 
And with your help, all things are possible. Lead us, O oh Lord. Lead us. Amen. Timothy McMahon King is the author of Addiction Nation. He writes about all the ways addiction robs us of freedom and offers ways the church, families, and government can better tackle the problem of addiction. He is a board member of the Center of Addiction and Faith and the keynote speaker of the next Addiction and Faith Conference. Tim is our co-host today, and he will introduce our topic and speaker for today. Tim, take it away. Thanks so much, Ed, and thank you to everyone who is here, and glad to have you here, whether or not you are a part of a faith community or identify that way. This is a conversation that we want to host to be able to explore this, so this might be something that you're just working with clients who faith is important to them. Um, you are welcome, or this is something where you're just curious about how this conversation is unfolding in the faith communities um, across the country. You are welcome here today. And this topic about narratives in addiction, if this is something that you are interested in, um, chances are, especially if you're part of a faith community or a faith leader yourself, you are all the time telling stories of how people change. And you are talking about what makes people change, how that happens, how that's driven. And that can be great to inspire others to keep telling those stories of what that trajectory has looked like. But sometimes those narratives and those stories we focus on can cover some things up. So for example, my mom, uh, I was raised in the evangelical tradition, so was she, and she was asked to give her testimony um, at church one Sunday. And she had known growing up in that tradition that the testimony normally starts off with how bad your life was. And then a moment when you have a conversion experience and you meet Jesus and everything turns around. So for her, she was, you know, 13, 14 years old, growing up on a farm in rural New Hampshire. She racked her brains for all the biggest sins she could think of, and then had to actually make up a few sins because she didn't think that her story fit into the narrative that everyone was expecting. And so there are ways all the time that the stories that are lifted up, sometimes very powerful stories um, about people who change under very difficult circumstances can be inspiring, but they can also cover up ways that a lot of other times change can happen. So if you're from the Christian tradition, you know that story of Saul on his way to Damascus, seeing a great light and becoming Paul, and his life is different all at once in a very dramatic way. But for a lot of us, that's not how life unfolds. There's steps forward, there's steps back, and there are often, more often than not, simply gentle turnings of the soul, as opposed to these dramatic changes that happen all at once. And had the pleasure of getting to meet Dr. Kate Gaudet on a digital conference addressing addiction in higher education and hear her work that just put a name to some of these very common narratives, some things that I had sensed before but hadn't quite had language for or distilled it down. And so in hearing her talk, and Ed also got to hear it, knew that this is something that we wanted to share with you all. And so uh, Kate is the Assistant Director of the Honors Program at UNH, so fellow New Hampshireite uh, with me up here in the North. And so we are glad to have her here today and excited for this presentation. And then also if you get a chance to join us for that informal conversation afterwards. And please do remember there's the Q&A box down at the bottom. Feel free to drop in your questions at any time. And the earlier you do that, the more likely we will be able to get to it. So Kate, I wanna hand it over to you now uh, for your presentation. Great, thank you so much. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and I'm really looking forward to the Q&A and all that um, all of you have to say about this topic. Um, my background is in literature. I um, So I've been interested in, in narratives for a long time and the way that they work. And along the way, I started to, to become interested in this in this question of addiction narratives and you know some of the similarities I saw and why did they all seem so similar and what was that leaving out? And I eventually um, started working toward the presentation I'm about to give to you and we'll be really, really happy to hear your feedback on it um, as I continue to work, um, work on this topic. So I'm gonna start by um, sharing my screen and here we go. And now I will do the slideshow. All right. Okay, I think that is correct. So, um, so this talk is called Narratives of Addiction, Recovery, and Redemption. Um, it's 
also the name of a course that I teach at UNH. So I've worked through some of these ideas, you know, in the company of, of a lot of students um, in, in New Hampshire. They're not all from New Hampshire, but uh, we're all in New Hampshire, which is, as you may know, um, a place that's been very, very hard hit by the opioid epidemic. So a lot of them have very personal experiences with this. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of images. So this is, uh, I wonder if any of you will, will recognize this image. This is um, an engraving from 1751. And, you know, in 1751, this is basically what counted for entertainment. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, it is a horrible image. It is. Uh, it was meant to really um, shock and dismay people who, who looked at it. Um, and it's also, in addition to being kind of horrific, um, extremely detailed. It is just layered with um, images and symbols and um, different stories going on. And we won't have time to talk about all of them. But um, the point of it is pretty clear, right? This is telling you what happens when you drink gin. Um, this came out at a time when gin was a big problem in Britain. Um, it has to do with, you know, as always, there's kind of an economic history where there was overproduction of grain and so gin became a byproduct of that and then there was lots of cheap gin and it was all it would get cut with turpentine it was very poisonous a lot of the time um and so william hogarth this engraver um made a, a pair of engravings i'm about to show you the other one to to show the horrors of gin and it came with a little poem on the bottom which i've put the first verse of um next to so you know nothing subtle here you can uh you can you can see what is going on and the, and this really striking image of in the middle of this woman just dropping her baby you know presumably to their death um because you know jen has just taken over her her every other thought instinct emotion in her life and then this is the other um this is the other engraving that was part of this pair called beer street now at first you might think okay more of the same However, when you look more closely, you see, oh wait, these people are actually quite happy. They're painting. It's not so crowded. They're just having a good old time here on Beer Street. And, and in this image, there are symbols of kind of commerce and building and, you know, the arts and things that are good that are happening. Um, the, the poem that went along with this one, you can see, is much more cheerful. And it actually went on to talk about how, you know, um, I wish I could remember the exact the exact words, but it was something about how how wonderful and British beer is as opposed to French water and wine and the you know non beer things they drink in France. So it's kind of nationalist. So I'm I start with these two images because you know they're both about alcohol. They're both about alcohol that you would drink, um, and yet we're getting two very very different sides of the coin here. Two very different stories, just um, or you might say different interpretations of this one drug from the same from the same person. So I like this as a way to just start thinking like, what are the different sides we can look at these stories from? And also I think they're really fun images and people should see them more. Um, so yeah, this one's a bit less fun. So as I mentioned, I'm in New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire, actually not far from um, where Tim King grew up. And unfortunately we are now remarkable as a state for being right there at the top of the opioid crisis. Um, we have really, really high overdose rates, um, really high addiction rates. A lot of it has um, has gotten worse because of the presence of fentanyl in the drug supply, so we're, which is causing a lot more deaths. Um, and it's a little bit of a surprise, you know. People usually think of the places that have been so hard hit as being in Appalachia or in, you know. Um, coal belt or rust belt kinds of places. We have some of that, you know, we're a very rural state. We have the old mill towns that have lost their industry. Um, we're a very, uh, we're an old state. So that's another thing that can actually contribute to um, an opioid supply because older people are likely to um, get prescriptions, which then either they may start to um, to use too much or other people may steal them. So it's uh, it's one way that kind of drugs enter a community is through having an older population. Um, so those are some things that have affected New Hampshire. We're also just kind of on supply lines in terms of, you know, the fishing industry is one route that, um, that some drugs come in on. And I, we kind of don't know exactly why, but we have seen our state really get hit terribly hard. We also have very, very poor social services. So um, there's not a lot of help for those who are affected. 
So, um, so this is just, you know, where we are now in New Hampshire and, um, and what we're seeing. So I'm going to move on now to what I see as the most typical way that addiction stories are told. So now again, we're kind of moving away from the social level to the individual level. Um, because actually, most often addiction is told as an individual story, and we can talk about whether that <laughs> makes sense or not. All right, so we're just going to start with this kind of person, you know, our, our generic person that I got from the PowerPoint icons. Um, he's just a kid. He's a regular person, right? And he goes through life. Um, ha, you know, he goes to school. He has fun with his friends. We don't see any problem here. Everything's fine. Um, as he gets older, he might find a partner, he might get a job, right? Um, but then maybe at some point, he's just a little bit at a loss. He doesn't quite know what's, what to do. He feels some kind of lack or loss in his life. And then we have drugs, drugs enter the picture. Now, maybe he's done some drinking before, you know, it, does, it doesn't necessarily mean this is the first time he's encountered drugs, but there's some kind of, um, in narrative, what we call an inciting incident, a thing that causes a change in the story. And you all know what happens next, right? We have this big downhill slope. Um, you see him there drinking alone. You see uh, the possibility of danger and then ambulance, um, run-ins with the law, uh, institutionalization, whether in a hospital or in a prison. Um, we often hear about cycling through, you know, you might try to get better and, and, and relapse and just keep, um, keep going through these cycles until you end um, in death. Or as, as in AA, I think there's a phrase about, um, somebody can probably remind me of this institution, uh, I, I, it's slipping my mind, but you end institutionalized, hospitalized or dead um, is what they will often say is what the result of addiction will be. So this is a really sad, quite common um, story of addiction. But of course it's not the only story, right? We have this one too. So what if we have another inciting incident? What if at rock bottom there, um, our, our hero meets another person who says, hey, come to a meeting with me, let's talk. Um, let's, let's, and in that community, he kind of learns some new skills. He learns how to handle his addiction. He switches to coffee, right? He, he starts collecting those sobriety chips. He um, gets healthier habits uh, and eventually he can achieve, you know, a happy, normal life um, as part of a community and with meaningful work and finding meaning in the world. So that's our good story, right? Like that's the story of recovery and redemption. And those of you who, who work in the Christian tradition will, will I'm sure recognize this as sort of a, a redemption story, um, which is one of the things that, that first drew me to this topic. I thought I've heard this story before, right? <laughs> like I think this comes out of that, that tradition. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. So we've got two stories here. Um, and from what I have seen, almost every time someone tells a story about addiction, it's going to follow one of these two tracks. Um, and it might be, somebody might be, you know, farther back along the track. We don't know which way it's going to go yet. Of course, you never know whether or not somebody will recover. You never know whether somebody's recovery will last. So in terms of where you are in the story, it can be very hard to say. But this is a story that most of us have kind of imprinted into our minds. And um, I had thought about this for a long time and I had made that whole chart. And then I went and found this, which I did not know existed, but basically tells the same story. So some of you will probably be familiar with this Jelinek curve. And you can see, I actually took it from the Hazelden um, website. So this is something that was developed in the 1940s and it came out of surveys. I'm actually gonna zoom in so you can actually read some of it. Um, it came out of surveys that were done by um, Alcoholics Anonymous of their members. Unfortunately, it was a terribly done study. So they got pretty low response rates to their survey as you know, as happens with surveys. Um, and then when they were um, analyzing the data, they found that say the responses from women were so different that they just threw them out and said, well, these are outliers, so we're not going to consider these, um, these responses. So the only, uh, they, they basically kind of narrowed down the subset of this very already small uh, response pool to, to get an idea of what are the steps that people go through in addiction and recovery. So basically the data is terrible. <laughs> and, and yet, as um, <laughs> it is typical, as somebody said in the comments, uh, still a problem in medical research. Um, 
but you know, as uh, as you can see here, this is still on the Hazelden website, right? Like this is still in the conversation. These particular steps that people go through as they go through um, addiction and recovery, um, and some people will go through these steps. But again, it's it's a story, right? It's not actually data. It's a story that um, that we have been telling about the way addiction works. So I think this is important because, and actually this audience probably doesn't need telling this, but that I think that there's a way in which the way we understand narratives, these conventions that are kind of in our heads already about all kinds of different things, will change the way we understand and perceive reality. Um, so there is some scientific data on this. There's some research that shows that, say, people who see themselves as kind of the hero of their own story, um, as, as a person with a lot of choice and agency, will interpret thing, bad things that happen to them as kind of setbacks, right? They don't interpret them as the end of the road. They don't interpret them as, as um, telling them to go in a different direction. They'll be more optimistic about the way that they um, are proceeding. So it's going to change their actual behavior as well as the way that they feel about things. Um, you can also think about this in terms of, um, if you're in this group, I'm sure you have thought before about the difference between understanding and understanding addiction in terms of sin and crime, uh, sin versus crime versus disease, like those different paradigms of understanding will really change the way um, you want to approach an addiction. So because I think it matters what these underlying narrative conventions are, I have done some thinking about which of which kind of cultural stories are um, I think affecting the way that we understand addiction. So this one, it is actually a total pleasure to share this screen with this group because usually I share it and nobody knows what it is. <laughs> and I don't think that will be the case here. So Pilgrim's Progress, as you probably know, is, is a, a 17th century text by John Bunyan that is an allegorical story of a person's um, person named Christian, um, his journey from kind of um, normal life through various stages um, toward heaven. And from this text come some expressions that are very common um, that we still use like the slough of despond and um, the shadow of the valley of death, or sorry, the val I can't remember exactly how it's put in the book. Um, but you know, so those different stages, oh, there it is, the shadow of the, sorry, I can't read it down at the bottom there. Valley of the shadow of death. Um, so he's going to proceed through these different stages until he reaches heaven. Um, and here again, this is this this is the conversion narrative, right? This is where you um, you start off kind of normal. You go through some, you, you know, you are a sinner because you are a person in the world, and you at some point have to go through just a rock bottom kind of place that you um, are by grace, by fellowship, um, rescued from and through the, through your own faith and through the kindness of others and through the grace of God, you are saved, right? You are able to continue on your path and have this, this really, um, more, more wonderful, more hopeful, more, um, spiritual kind of life on the other end. So this is really, I mean, this is the central idea of that addiction story. And that's not a coincidence, as you may know, um, the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous were part of a, I think a Calvinist um, evangelical group that was very invested in this kind of story. And so it makes sense that the kind of bones of the structure um, would, would kind of be maintained. That's just not, that's not just AA, that's like a lot of American culture, right? Like we tell the story all the time about all kinds of things. Um, but I think that the, particularly in the addiction community, I think that sort of Christian Protestant um, background just still shines through in a lot of ways. Um, to take a, a very different <laughs> approach here, um, Another thing that we talk about when we talk about addiction is peer pressure. And the image I have here is from Pinocchio. You might not remember this part from Pinocchio, um, but uh, you know, when little Pinocchio first, he's very innocent, you know, he's, he was literally born, you know, yesterday and he ventures out, he's supposed to go to school and on his way to school, he is waylaid by these bad kids who tell him, come with us and we're going to go to Pleasure Island and we're going to, um, 
uh, have a much more fun time than going to school. So this idea that there are like bad people out in the world who are just ready to, to suck you in, you know, to put out the umbrella and hook you in um, because just because they're evil and bad and want to hurt you. It's something we've been telling children for a long time. Um, it's what the D.A.R.E. program basically said when I was in school that, um, you know, you had to just say no because people were going to try to push you into using drugs. And I can't say that I was ever like nobody ever tried to push me into using drugs. I don't know if I was just never in the right place at the right time or what. But um, but peer pressure is, of course, a factor in drug use. Um, as we were discussing before, the more people around you are using drugs, the more likely you are to use drugs. Um, people may there. There's also some evidence that um, that kids will use drugs if they are struggling to fit in and they feel like that will, you know, again, if the other kids are doing it, then maybe that will help them fit in. So peer pressure exists. I just don't think it exists exactly in this kind of Pinocchio form. And sometimes we miss the boat when we are, when we're thinking this way. And D.A.R.E. is actually a really fantastic example of that because um, all the evidence that has been done, has been collected says that D.A.R.E. did not work at all. And in fact, may have been counterproductive. It may have made some groups of students more likely to use drugs than they would have been otherwise. So I think, again, the, the sort of, um, uh, mistaken focus on this form of peer pressure kind of took the focus away from the real forms of peer pressure that that um, are acting on on kids. All right, now we're going to um, <laughs> this is this is kind of a deep cut. So uh, I hope some of you know this story, this poem, because it's fantastic. But there's a poem called Goblin Market. Now I'm making the argument that this is kind of this is an idea that's sort of ingrained in our cultural understanding, even though maybe none of us have ever read this poem before. So bear with me. I'm going to um, tell you the story of this poem that was, um, it's a Victorian poem by Christina Rossetti. So it came out in the, in the 19th century. And the, here's the story of the poem. So there's a pair of sisters who are living in a little cottage by the edge of a wood. And in that wood live some goblins. And, and as they go to get their water at the well, the goblins will say, hey, come and have some of our fruit. We have this delicious fruit. You should try some. So again, we have these kind of pushers in the story. Um, and one of the sisters is tempted by the goblins and she goes and eats the fruit. And it's described as an absolute orgy. You know, she's just she, <laughs> covering herself with fruit because she just can't eat it fast enough um, and gorges herself on fruit. And then the goblins go away and the sister goes home and she goes into immediate withdrawal. She, you know, what we would recognize as withdrawal. She, um, she can't do anything else. She can't eat anything else. All other food makes her sick. She starts to just waste away. Her hair turns gray because she is so obsessed with this fruit and the goblins have disappeared. Um, so she can't get it. So we recognize here what, what feels familiar here is this idea of, of, the chemical hook, this idea that once you taste, once you ingest this substance, it changes your brain. It just gets into your brain and actually makes you a different person who doesn't have a choice, right? You don't have any agency there. You just are obsessed with finding more of this substance. Um, it's a way that we often understand withdrawal. It's a way that we understand the way addiction works. I mean, addiction doesn't really work that way. You know, most of the time it takes many tries of a drug to, to become addicted to it. Um, but this, the power of a drug to just get into your brain and change it and change your personality, um, I do think is a really strong cultural story. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, I will tell you this, this particular story has a happy ending. The, um, the, the non-tempted sister goes and finds the goblins. And while she does not taste the fruit, because we have learned our lesson about that, um, she, they kind of smear it all over her. And so she goes home and lets her sister kind of lick the juice off and that cures her. So it's okay in the end, just in case you were worried. I do recommend reading the poem though. It's fantastic. All right. Um, and then finally, my last story I want to talk about is the story of the deal with the devil. So this is an image from Faust, um, which is, um, you know, a story that's told in, in very, by various people in different ways. But um, the basic idea is there is a, uh, a man who wants a thing. In this case, as you can see, it is a beautiful woman depicted in the mirror there and makes a deal with the devil to... Um, 
to get what he wants by selling his soul, right? So in terms of uh, drugs and addiction, we often hear this kind of story with artists um, where, or creative people who either believe or are believed to um, use a drug in order to make themselves more creative. Uh, they think they can be a better musician or a better artist by using a drug. And then as we know, many of those people end up um, having real problems with addiction and overdose. Um, so, so that deal with the devil story, you know, does it really help you be more creative or does it, um, is it a deal with the devil or is it just a mistake, right? Is, or is it actually just a reaction to the, the difficulties of their situation? Okay, so those are the stories I'm going to um, give you for now that I think are already kind of in the way we think about addiction. Here's a couple counter stories here. And again, you may be pretty familiar with some of these facts um, and you may not be. So the first one that <laughs> is kind of a hard thing to, to talk about, but most drug users don't actually have problems with addiction. And if you think about everybody you know in your life who has ever tried a drug, You'll probably say, yeah, most of them are okay, right? Um, think about it with alcohol, right? If you know 100 people who use alcohol, you might know 10 who have problems with it. I mean, that your mileage may vary on that. I, I hope that you don't know too many people who have problems with alcohol, but most people will use drugs and be okay. Um, and that is not at all part of the way we talk about it, especially with younger people, which makes sense, right? Like we don't want people to you know, take that 10% risk and, and which is, you know, that's something, right? Um, but it does kind of, you know, this is one of the problems with D.A.R.E. where students were seeing like my friend, you know, smokes weed and he doesn't seem to have had his life ruined by it. You know, they're seeing the people on the other side and it's kind of making them distrust the dangers that they're being told about. Um, the next one is about chemical dependency. So again, we have that chemical hook idea that we think that once you try a drug, it's in your brain, you can't, you know, you can't change it. You just don't have the same brain anymore. Um, chemicals do matter, withdrawal matters, but it's not the whole story. So a good example of this is that if you give smokers nicotine, so they, you know, they have the same level of nicotine in their system, that's the addictive part of cigarettes, right, is nicotine. Um, only about 17% of them will be able to quit. So it's not withdrawal. They are they have the chemical. The chemical hook is um, is is you know satisfied. It's the other things that they're smoke that they're using smoking for, right? Like people use it as a social thing. They use it as a stress release. It's a habit. You know, there's various other things that go into the addiction, um, and that's true with other drugs as well. So. Um, this next one is about recovery programs. Um, and actually, I think I need to revise the way I have put this based on a conversation we were having earlier. But most people who go into recovery programs um, don't come out um, you know, cured. They don't come out the way they necessarily thought they were gonna come out. Um, most people will continue to use drugs after going into recovery. As we were discussing before this idea of, uh, and I think this might've come up in a previous meeting that you had, um, that if you, know, if you say that it only works if you're abstinent, then you're kind of leaving out people who may have reduced use and there might be other ways in which you know, they're healthier after the program than before. So this is a little bit oversimplified. But the reason I think it's important to point out is again, if a person goes into a program and they're like, all right, I'm doing it 28 days, I'm gonna be recovered and they come out and they start using again, then they think, oh, what's wrong with me? You know, I did the program and I guess I'm just hopeless, right? So if that person knows that actually most people go through that same experience, most people are going to start using again after a recovery program, you know, it, it takes away some of that shame and, um, and despair. And finally, um, the most common outcome of addiction is recovery without treatment. So that is a real shocker, I think, for most of us. And it, um, it doesn't mean that most people who are addicted will recover without treatment. It's if you take all the people who struggle with addiction and you kind of divide them out into different outcomes, one of the outcomes is they never recover. They're addicted till the end of their life. Another outcome is they go into treatment and they recover. Another outcome is they don't go into treatment and they still recover. So it turns out that of those, 
the first, the last one that I said is most common. A lot of people will actually kind of age out of addictions. Um, they will get older and something changes in their brain or something changes in their life and they are able to stop using or to moderate using in a healthy way um, without going through 12 steps, without going into rehab. Um, that is not to say at all that people shouldn't be, people who are struggling with addiction shouldn't be encouraged to get into whatever help and program they can because that's, you know, there's a lot of life loss and a lot of danger that happens in the time before um, somebody might be able to recover. But it's also, it can be kind of a hopeful thing for people to realize that many people who seem like they're going nowhere will recover eventually. All right, so this is, um, <laughs> this is I love this chart. Um, this is something I especially like to share with my college students uh, because I think it undercuts the way that we often understand alcohol um, and, and the consumption of alcohol. Um, if you look at, you know, if you ask college students how many people drink, they're gonna tell you everybody drinks. It's not true, right? Um, if you look at this chart, if you look at kind of the, the left end of the chart, so basically they've taken all American adults, they've chopped the population up into, into tenths, right? So the bottom 30% and really 40%, if you're looking at that, just does not drink, right? This is drinks per week. Um, there's just not, they, they just aren't drinkers. And that might be for religious reasons. It might be for health reasons. It might be they just don't like it. Um, there are plenty of reasons you might not drink. But I think in our conversation about alcohol, generally, there's this, this sense that you're an outlier if you don't drink, at least where I live. I don't know, that may be different in different parts of the country, but you know, the sort of assumption is everybody drinks like a certain amount. Um, as you go up the chart, you know, you notice that, say you're drinking, okay, I'll, I'll give you my own, <laughs> my own place on this chart. I tend to have a glass of wine every night. That puts me in the eighth or ninth uh, decile here. So that is pretty high. Like that puts me in the top third of drinkers in the US. And I think I consider that a very moderate amount of drinking. Um, so th for me, that's sort of like, wait, oh, I guess what I thought about my drinking actually doesn't match on to what the data is telling me here. I drink more than most people in the country. However, once you get up into that top one, it's another level, right? Um, so the top decile, 10% of people in the US of, of American adults are drinking 73.85 drinks per week. That's, you know, 10 drinks a day, more than 10 drinks a day, um, which is a shocking amount to be drinking, uh, if you're me at any rate. Uh, and I can't, I, I mean, I try to be very like open about people can be healthy at different levels, but I just can't think that anybody who's drinking that much, that that is good for them and that they are, you know, doing okay in their lives. So, um, this, you know, this tracks with a lot of other things where, um, a small percentage of people will do most of the consumption of a given thing. But one thing I think it's worth drawing attention to is that in if you're if you're the alcohol industry, let's say, and you imagine that you dropped that top 10%, right? That adds up to way more than the rest of the chart combined. If you get rid of problematic drinking, your industry collapses. I'm not saying that's a conspiracy. I'm not saying they're trying to make people addicted, but I am saying that like I think if there's that kind of moral hazard that if you have an industry that entirely depends on problematic drinking, that's something we should be paying attention to probably a little bit more than we are. All right. Um, and then this is just another kind of um, uh, place where we our perceptions might be different from what the data shows us. This is this chart's a little bit old and it's also British. So it's, you know, you can't take it with a grain of salt for that reason, but um, what this is based on a study that was tracking the harm coming out of different kinds of substances. And, um, and they divided it out between harm to users and harm to others. And the real clear takeaway here is that alcohol causes way, way, way more harm than any other drug and than most other drugs combined. Um, there have been other studies in the US as well that have, have backed this up. If you are somebody who is a social worker or who um, you know, works in the community, you've probably seen this, right? That most of the problems, if you're a police officer, you know, most of the problems you see are, are because of alcohol, um, whether it's violence, whether it is driving issues, whether it is harm to oneself, alcohol is the worst villain that we have um, in, 
in our country and in Britain and in many other countries. Um, so while we talk a lot about the dangers of opioids and they are extremely dangerous, um, that just sort of points out how much we're not talking about the dangers of alcohol, which are causing even more harm than that. So, okay, so now that we've done our kind of like myth busting or, or not exactly myth busting, but just like here are some other facts that we should be considering. Um, I want to talk about a couple other narrative conventions that we might think about more as we um, consider addiction. All right, so here's the first one. Some of you may recognize this still from the movie Animal House. Now, the movie Animal House does not depict, you know, <laughs> like the kind of behavior that we would hope to be seeing. Um, I work at a university and I have heard from students that there is kind of a, a saying that it's not an addiction until you graduate. So you can drink as much as you want when you're in college. Um, as long as you're not drinking after college, it's not a problem. Which, you know, that's not what I really want to hear from my students, but they might have a little bit of a point. Um, if you think about it, you know, college students binge drinking on the weekend is not good, but it's not as bad as somebody who is, you know, 35 with a job and a family binge drinking on the weekends, right? Like it does make a difference where you are in life and what your responsibilities are. Um, that uh, that means the same kind of behavior might not mean the same thing at different times in life. And I think that kind of life phase stuff is important for us to consider. Um, here's some more things about age. Uh, so it is definitely true that early drug use is a really strong risk factor for addiction. So if people are using drugs at the age of 12 or 13, they're much, much more likely to use drugs than somebody who that to, to become addicted rather than somebody who doesn't start using until they're 16, 17, 18. If you make it to 25, you're probably gonna be okay. <laughs> and uh, it is true that most active addiction happens between the late adolescent and early adult periods. So kind of late teens to early thirties um, is where you'll see the worst problems with addiction. For people who do um, recover without treatment, it's sometimes called natural recovery it's often after about 10 years of use. So if you're somebody who starts struggling with addiction when you're 20, you may be kind of phasing out of it around the age of 30. That's a long time, right? Um, it's, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble in that time. You can lose a whole lot of opportunities in that time. You don't want to see anybody go through this for 10 years, but um, it can be kind of helpful to think, well, maybe they will find their way out after a while. Um, so many of you will be familiar with this work, um, by Bruce Alexander. So this might be kind of a review, but one way to look at addiction, um, is as a response to trauma or to need. So we talked before about the chemical hook idea, and that, um, really comes from these studies that were done back in the mid 20th century, where you've seen these pictures, I'm sure, where they put a rat or a mouse in a cage and they give them some bottles um, and one of them has water and one of them has a drug in it, cocaine or morphine or whatever they're doing. And what they found was that the rats would use the drugs so much that they would not eat. Um, they would end up overdosing. They would kill themselves, basically. If they were given as much drugs as they wanted, they would kill themselves. Um, and this kind of led to this idea that if you, it, that drugs are so powerful that they'll even override your survival instinct, right? That they, um, that's why they, they kind of rewire people's brains. Cause you know, if, if they, if you can't even keep yourself alive, you know, imagine um, how powerful these things are. So a researcher in Canada in the seventies, Bruce Alexander sort of recognized an issue with these experiments, which were that the rats were just in cages, you know, all by themselves. <laughs> and that that's not a real healthy environment for anybody. Um, and if you were in a cage all by yourself with nothing but cocaine, you might do a lot of cocaine. Um, so he created this thing called Rat Park, which um, was an environment that rats like to be in, right? Um, it had toys and it had other rats and it had, you know, just various kind of pleasant 
things for the rats to do. And it also included those bottles of, of drugs. And what he found is that um, the rats would use the drugs, but kind of in a way that we would call recreational. You know, nobody overdosed. None of these rats overdosed. Um, they would use them occasionally and then go back to their rat lives. So the, the great line that he came out with from this experiment experiment was the problem isn't the drug the problem is the cage um, and that he thought we could expand this to humans as well to say when people are using drugs it's because their environment is a problem like they're not having connections with other people they don't have hope they don't have you know meaningful employment you know there are these other things that are causing the drug problems not the drug itself all right, I think I'm, I'm running over, so I'm gonna go through these things kind of quickly, but um, many of you will also be very familiar with this um, idea of adverse childhood experiences. So this is um, a list of things that can happen to you as a child that basically predict negative outcomes later in life. And there are things like abuse and neglect, um, parental death or illness, um, your own illness, you as a child having an Ill illness, like various things that can happen to you when you're little. And it turns out that if you um, ask people how many of these things they've experienced, they um, there's an extremely strong correlation with later negative outcomes, including addiction. Now, I do also want to point out, um, if you look at this chart I have here, that the, the y-axis only goes up to 18%. So even though we're seeing a huge correlation, right, and you're much more likely to become addicted to alcohol, if you have more of these ACEs, you're still less than 20%. Uh, it's still less than 20% probability, right? So it's more likely, but it doesn't mean everybody is fated to, to, if you have these bad childhoods, it doesn't mean you're fated to then become an addict. It just means you're more likely to. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, one reason for that might be that, you know, there's kind of healthy bonding mechanisms and skills that aren't being learned. And, and so they're kind of turning to drugs in place of that um, later in life. All right, and this is a chart I borrowed from uh, the New Hampshire Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a fantastic group in our state. Um, and they like to say, instead of this kind of big arc that I showed you earlier, can we think of it instead as a continuum, right? It's not like you're either addicted or you're not. It's that, okay, there are different ways of using and we want people to be moving toward healthier ways of, of using or not using. So um, if you're at excess at the top of the chart there, every step you take toward moderation is a good step, right? Even if you're not there yet, if you're taking those steps, we wanna, we wanna celebrate that. Um, and to frame it as a chronic health issue that we will treat rather than something we need to cure and just make, you know, take, a, take away this addiction. We, maybe we can't do that, right? Maybe we can just treat this issue and kind of keep you as healthy as we can. And I find that a really helpful model. This is another um, graph of this continuum um, where you can think of drug use in a lot of different ways. Again, it's not just like using and not using. It's like you might be using socially. Maybe you're using it a little more than you should, right? Um, maybe you're using chronically, like my daily glass of wine, I suppose you could call a chronic use, right? So if I am using chaotically, if it's really getting into my life and causing harm to myself and others, if I can move from that toward compulsive use, still not great, still not what we want, but it's better, right? And we can just keep thinking of moving toward the left end of that continuum. Um, and this is my final slide, which um, a student of mine drew. Actually, she also found that staircase image really helpful. Um, and she drew this uh, to represent the journey of somebody from chaotic use toward, um, toward a healthier life. And you can see that she, she put kind of some of the, the things that might keep you in addiction down there at the bottom. And then the things that will help you away from it, including faith. Um, uh, and support and connection, kind of moving toward the right side as a way to uh, think about what people might need to help them um, come out of that of that bad place in their lives. So I'm going to end there, and um, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. I saw a lot of things come up in the chat, so I hope we can get to uh, I hope we can get to a lot of those. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. And Ed, um, I know we're going to have to switch over to the other Zoom link soon. We have a couple minutes to kind of run through. Yeah, a few yeah, yeah. Not, not much time. We've got a couple questions we can do. 
All right, so I'll, I'll hit a couple of comments that came up just so that we, we address that and then uh, turn to one of the questions as well. So it had Cheryl um, raising the question of, was it DARE that didn't work or was it how it was implemented? Which I think is a good, good ongoing question to ask of, and do we have alternatives about education and prevention that could be better than how DARE might have been implemented in the 90s when I know I, I was going through it? Um, also had some requests both for your presentation and some more citations. Um, so I think that will be helpful so that people can do some further reading. Sure. Um, <clears throat> and then um, one other thing that was helpful was around uh, concerns about binge drinking too, that um, one joy uh, flagged that with early 20s and teens still while the prefrontal cortex is developing, that's still a high risk time to ever binge drink and just wanted to highlight that that danger is still there. Um, and then one uh, other question that came into the Q&A chat, um, <clears throat> again from Joy, saying, as a prevention specialist, we know that 90% of adults suffering from addiction started in their teens. Age of first, risk, uh, first use is a huge risk factor. And that those with four or more ACE um, ex adverse childhood experiences have exponentially greater chance of having a substance use disorder. Um, and we are need to engage in compassion-centered understanding of addiction. Is there any literature in your experience that offers this sort of narrative? So hitting early use and then ACE, um, high ACE scores. That's a great question. I'm trying to think of some. Um, yeah, so one of the problems I have with, um, with the literature around addiction is it uh, does tend to very closely track kind of that, that model that I showed you. Um, and a lot of it isn't very compassionate, right? Like it is sort of about like, you have to overcome this and sort of, you know, you know through luck, through grace, through fellowship, but, but it's very individualistic, right? And it doesn't um, necessarily indicate, um, you know, all of the bigger structural things and, and uh, effects that might be causing this. One book I really like um, is called Unbroken Brain. Have any of you read that book um, by Maya Salovitz? Um, it's S-Z-A-V. Uh, anyway, look up Unbroken Brain. That'll be easier than spelling her last name. Because um, she is a person who um, was addicted as a young person and did recover and kind of became a journalist. And um, and so she kind of goes back and forth between her own story and the more structural factors. So I like that as a way of getting away from just like, it's just me and my willpower and my, you know, my salvation. And instead being like, this is part of a much bigger system um, that has to do with, with all these other things around us. Yes. Thank you, uh, Hugh, for putting that name in the, in the chat. Um, there was a question about DARE, you know, was it the implementation um, rather than the program itself? Yeah, so it, from what I know about DARE, there wasn't a really strong, like it wasn't like it was one program that was just kind of rolled out everywhere. I think um, different police, it was usually police departments that were presenting it and they had a lot of discretion into as to how, um, you know, what they would do. Um, so probably there are some places where it was more effective and I think, in terms of what we know about what works, I mean, it's a lot like sex ed actually, where um, if you give honest information, students tend to do well with that. And if you are trying to cover things up, they kind of know and they um, they won't, you know, they'll, they'll sort of see the holes in what you're saying. Um, uh, so I think, I guess if I were doing drug education, which I think we should, right? Um, I think that would be my advo advice. Um, is to sort of try to be pretty honest about drug use. And, you know, the scare tactics do work for some kids, right? But then again, they're gonna see examples in their neighborhoods of people who aren't, who don't appear to be suffering those consequences. And that's gonna undermine some of it. So I think you just can't give them the idea of like, if you touch it once you're dead because they're gonna very quickly figure out that that's not true. And as William Miller covered in our last webinar, the external forces of control are never as strong in a person's life as cultivating that internal direction mm -hmm. where someone is deciding that those are, th those are the decisions they want to make. Yeah, um, that's a great point. One other great question here um, from Jennifer 
She said, I work with many patients who have moved from alcohol addictions to religious addictions. Mm. Are there any resources for addictions that are religious in nature? That is fascinating. <laughs> I don't know. That's the first time I've ever heard of that. Huh. I mean, I think though, I mean, the way, as I have thought more about addiction in the last few years, I have sort of moved into thinking it, of it more as not about the thing itself, right? Like, but more about just compulsive behavior um, and, or obsessive or compulsive behavior. And that can apply to anything, right? We know that it can apply to gambling or shopping or sex, right? It doesn't have to be a substance. So it makes sense that it could apply to religion as well. And actually in the Maya Salovitz book, there's a great, she has a great line about like, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't um, treat a person with OCD who's doing compulsive hand washing by like taking away their soap, right? You know, that wouldn't work. And so it, um, you would have, you kind of have to go to the source of like, what is driving this um, compulsion? And I mean, it might be a little bit, I wonder if some of the literature, there might be literature on like the idea of the dry drunk, right? Like the person who isn't drinking or isn't using, but hasn't done what they need to do to be healthier, right? So I wonder if you could look in that direction, but I don't know. I'd be fascinated to learn more about that. One of my favorite well, subjects like it too would be uh, Richard Rohr, Breathing Underwater, where it's not a medical definition of addiction, but he gives a more spiritual understanding of ways that we all participate in those processes huh. that are like addiction. Oh, I definitely want to look at that. Thank you. Um, and we got well, another I, recommendation. Here, Leo Booth, God too. becomes a drug. I haven't read that one, but this is really new to me, and I I am so excited to learn about it. So thank you. Yeah, well, and one of our other keynotes for the conference is uh, Sonia Waters, and she writes about how we still think of um, addiction as a, a um, bad behavior when really it's pain pain reduction mm -hmm. and that people people who, who overuse drugs are really medicating pain so if we would think of it as a health issue rather than a criminal issue or moral issue then we might have a better result i'm gonna um let people know that we'll continue this conversation this feels really uh like there's a lot of I mean, we've not seen this much chat before and a lot of good questions here so i think this is a great conversation looking forward to are we able to Zoom save with, the chat? Because I would love to be able to read all these comments. Yeah, I, I will copy that and send it to you. Thank you. And then uh, someone asked, why are we going over to a Zoom? Um, it, this is a webinar. Zoom offers webinar or a Zoom meeting. I don't know how to do a live face-to-face -face conversation on a webinar, but if there's a way to do that, I would love no, to hear it. But there um, there's not. So this is, you know, this is where the technology is. So um, I'm going to place the Zoom link in here one more time. Um, so you want to make sure you grab that before we close this meeting, because once this is closed, you won't be able to get that link. I had several people last time and didn't grab it soon enough and missed out on the great conversation afterwards. The, uh, we just started doing the following conversations on the last couple of webinars and found those to be really, really good conversations. So I'm, I'm encouraging folks to come over and have that conversation. I just have some closing comments before I let folks go on with their day. First, thanks to uh, Tim, my co-host, and Dr. Gaudet, wow, just really appreciate your work and uh, continue to watch um, the things that you produce. I just really think this is going to contribute a great deal to helping us deal with the truth of addiction in, in our society. I think there's some myths out there that do need to be exposed and, and readdressed in some healthy, positive ways. So thank you for your sharing. I'm, I'm excited about what you're doing. Thank you so much. I want much. you to watch for upcoming webinars. We have. Uh, Lots of exciting topics coming up. Uh, we don't have them ironed down, but I can tell you we're working on addiction and race. We're going to continue to make that a, an important topic um, because it's so tied in with the injustice and some of the racial issues we face today. We want to talk about addiction, youth, and families because uh, uh, prevention and education is really important. Uh, we want to talk about addiction in the LGBTQ community and some of the particular challenges they face. We want to talk about addiction and the war on drugs. So many great topics, but we'll be working on all of those each month. Now, I had uh, proposed to Tim an idea that I think that uh, would be great, but uh, Tim is going to be the next keynote speaker at our next conference. And I said, hey, as a, as a preparation for that conference, what if we did a book study? Um, and then Tim would meet with folks that were interested in going through his book, preparing for the conference. He, his book is, uh, is uh, Addiction Nation. And uh, so he is going to 
put together a little bit of a proposal in terms of days and times, and, and we'll begin to uh, publicize that. So if you want to do a, a book study with the author, um, what a great opportunity. So Tim will meet with all of you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll send out a registration and a sign up for that. The Addiction Face Conference is October 7th, 8th, and 9th. It's the, it's the pillar of what we do. It's the centerpiece, and it's really the best thing we do. I hope you can make it. it this year, will be offered in person or virtually. Uh, we'll be following strict CDC guidelines for safety, and we'll adjust those as needed. But um, I can't even tell you how excited I am by what we're going to be offering there. Besides our amazing keynote speakers, there will be some amazing breakouts uh, that will make your head spin. There's so many great choices. You won't even know what to do. Motivational interviewing addiction science, harm reduction, the war on drugs and race and justice, youth and family. We're gonna have a whole track on youth and family and how to, how, uh, how to deal with addiction. Behavioral addictions like food, gambling, shopping, codependency, exercise, work, gaming, sex, internet, core competencies for addiction, pastoral care, trauma, mental health and addiction, developing leaders for addiction ministry, grief and addiction related death. Is your head spinning yet? A lot of good stuff. I didn't get to the bottom of the list, but I think I've said enough. Lots of great stuff. Uh, we'll have meaningful worship, a bookstore, exhibitors, we'll have chair massages, uh, spiritual practices to learn, uh, recover yoga, great food and fellowship, and best of all, some of my finest dad jokes, which I will bring. I uh, hope you plan to come and bring a team from your congregation, help Both us save some lives. <laughs> he's not kidding, he's always done. So um, as I said in the beginning, I left my call as a senior pastor to do this work, and I'm trusting God to provide. I can't do this work alone need help to keep it going. I'm looking for ministry partners to sustain this great work. I think it's amazing. Um, but I would invite you to consider being one of those partners, uh, asking you to make a one-time donation or better yet, an ongoing regular gift to keep the ministry going. If you're able and willing to do that and uh, would, would do that, I invite you to go to our website, addictionandfaith.com, click on the donate button. PayPal will allow you to make a one-time gift or an ongoing gift. But I'm deeply grateful for any support you can offer, including your prayers. So thank you. And th thank you for being here today. God bless you and keep you. God's face shine on you and be gracious to you. God, look upon you with favor and give you peace as you go and serve the Lord. I hope to see you now over at our Zoom meeting. Thanks, everyone. Bye.